Hello, everyone, and welcome to Clara's latest webinar, Improving Recovery Objectives with OpenZFS. I'm your host, Alan Jude. I'm the CTO here at Clara, and I'm joined today by Jim Salter, an OpenZFS mercenary system in, who's going to share some of his experiences of using ZFS to create better backups. How you doing, everybody? Uh, as we go, you can use the question answer function in Zoom uh, to ask your questions, and we'll try to get to those as part of the presentation. Uh, so I guess, take it away, Jim. All right, so what we want to do today, um, first and foremost, we're going to need to do a quick overview of concepts and terms, because we're not just talking about technical stuff today, we're talking about actual business objectives. And it seems like that's something that tends to go by the wayside a little bit more frequently than it should in IT, but it's very important. Uh, once we know about our uh, concepts and terms, we can talk about our recovery objectives and how to achieve them. And then uh, once we get done, we'll get to some Q&A. Alan, you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide? Yep. <laughs> there we go. Animations. All right. Yeah, waiting for those animations. Oh, and there's our little uh, city of the future, I guess. Um, oh yeah, so I kind of mentioned this a minute ago. Uh, you need to understand business objectives, not just technology objectives, because if whatever you're doing with technology doesn't actually advance a business mission, Nobody's going to pay you to do it, and that's important if you want to actually put food on the table. So before we get into ZFS, let's talk about two of my favorite BizOps terms, RPO and RTO. Next slide. <clears throat> Whoa. Our, there it goes. Okay. Um, all right. So RPO is recovery point objective. And when you talk to most sysadmins about backups, Unfortunately, RPO is frequently about the only thing they really focus on. Um, and it's just, it boils down to how frequently are you backing up your system? Your recovery point objective is basically what is the maximum amount of data that you should be losing if you have a recovery event necessary. So if you back up once per day, your recovery point objective is 24 hours because your worst case scenario, assuming nothing extra broke, is it's been you know 23 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds since your last backup. Now, if you lose more data than that, you have failed your recovery point objective, which unfortunately is possible. So we kind of you know, have two things that we need to do with the RPO. We need to know what our recovery point objective is. You know, what is a, an acceptable amount of data to lose when you have a catastrophic event that you need to recover from? And then you need to figure out how to make sure you don't fail that recovery point objective when it comes time to actually get going. <clears throat> Another thing to consider is just because you start a backup every 24 hours, your recovery point objective is going to be since that backup finished. Um, and so if it takes four hours to run a backup, um, then it means if you fail after 24 hours, you don't actually have that backup. You only have the complete backup from the day before, and now you're actually almost two days behind. You have to consider how long uh, it takes to run the backup and, and basically when you're restoring, what is the point you're going to be able to restore to? Correct. And it can actually go either way. Um, it's, it's sort of the worst case scenario. It can, you can end up needing to measure from when you begin the backup or when you complete it. Because for example, you know, in Alan's uh, scenario where it takes four hours to complete a backup, um, your recovery point doesn't actually start from when the backup finishes. It starts from when it began because right. generally any backup technology, not just ZFS, uh, you need to actually freeze the data that you're backing up before you begin backing it up. So that point that you're trying to reach is the point at which you froze all the data before the backup began. Now, if your backup fails before it finishes, then yeah, now you're looking at an even worse case scenario where you don't have your most recent backup, you're gonna have to fall back to the one from the day before. Yeah, and that's why <clears throat> probably once a day might not be good enough. Shall we advance? All right, now this is the one that I think nowhere near enough people talk about and think about, your recovery time objective. Our recovery point objective was about how much data we actually lost when we had to do a recovery event after a catastrophe. Your recovery time objective is about how long it takes to complete that restoration and have everything actually working again. Uh, it's possible to have, you know, lose no data whatsoever, 
but end up just absolutely crippling the business because it takes you a couple of days to get everything back up again and you can't accomplish anything in the meantime. This is a lot more complex to, to model and to understand and really get a solid grasp on than RPO, in my opinion, because there's so many different failure modes and how you recover from them is going to be different in you know, every possible failure. So you want to be thinking about everything from a, a software error to a user error to malignant user to malware to all kinds of hardware failures. You need to have a really good idea and a game plan for all the possible things that might happen to your stack ahead of time so that when something happens and you need to recover, you're not scrambling and sweating and worrying. You're just following a playbook. Yeah, and again, you got to measure against the worst case scenario. You know, if if we lose the whole virtualization server, we're going to restore all those VMs. But first, we're going to need somewhere to restore them to. And how long is that going to take? Which is why, ideally, um, it, everything always depends on budget. But also, what your budget for this kind of thing is, large part depends on how well you communicate with business leaders to begin with. Um, you may find it very difficult to get them to spend much money on backup and restoration initially, but if you explain things in business terms, if you do a little bit of a, you know, back of the napkin math and say, all right, we figure an average salary is around $50,000 a year. That means that you're earning about $25 to $30 an hour per person in payroll. Now you know how much it's going to cost a business to be down, for example, for four working hours and to have their, all of their employees basically just sitting and spending and getting paid to do nothing until the servers are back up. Now, if you can communicate with, uh, you know, your, your C-levels or your business owners or, or, you know, whatever the situation is, if you can communicate with them in those terms and talk about this is what it costs when the system goes down for this amount of time, this is what we can spend to avoid that happening, you may discover that your, you know, catastrophe and recovery budget increases significantly. Right. Again, like you, you said at the beginning, it's about explaining it in business terms of if we don't have these backups, then, you know, if something happens, we'll be down for three days and not able to do anything. And then suddenly, uh, you know, it's not such a, a nice to have anymore. It's something that's critical. <clears throat> All right, so because we're talking about ZFS specifically, our recovery point objective is really easy to figure out because you get you have a recovery point every time you take a snapshot. Now, this is for most catastrophes. Your RPO has already been defined the second that you take the actual snapshot. If you don't have a massive hardware failure on your production hardware or you don't have somebody who's not just a malicious user, but a malicious or sufficiently incompetent, <laughs> you know, admin with root level access, literally wiping everything, you can just roll back from almost anything that comes in. Uh, you know, if you have a malware intrusion event, you can just identify the time that the malware hit the network and, you know, who it was who clicked the shiny link, take their machine offline, roll back to the most recent snapshot prior to the malware intrusion, and that's it, you're done, uh, your recovery point is solid. Um, now, your recovery point can be a little bit more complex on your more catastrophic failures. If you have somebody who's got, you know, root level access to your host and they literally destroy all the data sets on the pool, now you're looking at having to make some decisions about, well, am I replicating my data back onto this production hardware from a, an offsite disaster recovery or an onsite hot spare or do I have on spare hot? Do I have on site hot spare hardware that I've been replicating to regularly? In which case, I'll be able to just go ahead and spin things up there. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit because now I'm talking about RTO, your recovery time objective, as well as your recovery point objective. But you kind of have to go back and forth between the two because they're each important and you have to understand both. Yeah. And I think, especially like you said, in the <clears throat> case of um, malware or something, your RPO isn't necessarily just your most, most recent backup, because if the malware has been running for some hours, uh, your most recent backup might include already contaminated data, and you'll need to go back further in order to get uh, a clean copy of the files. And so it can be important to have a selection of backup points to, to return back to. And that's another place where ZFS really excels because you can make them so quickly 
and so cheaply that you can keep a large selection of, of snapshots to roll back to. That's an excellent point. Uh, when we talk about RPO, it's important to remember that your recovery point objective, it's not measured from right now necessarily. It's measured from when the catastrophe happened. So if your catastrophe is, you know, a massive hardware failure, well then sure, it's fairly obvious, you know, you're, you're counting back down from there. But when we talk about something like a malware intrusion, you know, ransomware, you may have gone three or four hours before a user actually reported the ransomware or you detected it well enough to understand. So your recovery point objective is not the time before right now, it's actually the time before that event occurred. So when you wanna talk about an absolute RPO rather than a relative one, it also becomes important. You need to be monitoring your systems in a way that you actually uncover problems rapidly. Because again, not all of them are going to be as obvious as the cleaning person pulled the power plug out of the back of the server. Yep. Yeah. But as with all backups, uh, they're only good if you actually take them. Correct. Um, a lot of folks, they, they get themselves into trouble they discover ZFS and they're like, okay, this is great. I've learned about snapshots. I like snapshots. Roll, rolling back is awesome. So if I'm about to do something really risky, I can hit the command line. I can say ZFS snapshot my pool slash my data set at before dumb thing. And I can roll back if it didn't work. And that is great, but it predicates on you having taken the snapshot prior to the problem occurring. So it is really nice to know how to and to practice, you know, going to the command line and taking manual snapshots before you do something. But it's even more important. And, you know, in a mission critical environment, you want to have some kind of a framework that's automatically taking snapshots for you at a prescribed interval. Because again, that's going to lock down that RPO for you. If snapshots only happen whenever you personally manually take them, you, you're never going to know ahead of time what your recovery point objective is or whether you'll be able to reach it because you don't know when your most recent snapshot was until you go digging for it and hoping for the best. <clears throat> now, there are several snapshot management frameworks out there. Um, I personally am a huge fan of Sanoid, as I should be, since I was the initial developer on it. Uh, there's also ZFS Auto Snapshot, which is... Um, ZFS Auto Snapshot is a bit older. It's also considerably simpler than Sanoid. Uh, a lot of folks like it for that reason. Uh, Sanoid is policy defined, and I think it kind of stands out on that basis. Everything in Sanoid is about defining business policies about your data, and you can set those policies recursively, meaning if you set one for pool slash images and all your VMs are beneath that and other data sets, that policy will apply to all of those data sets beneath images as well as images itself. And you can define an entire policy about how you want snapshots taken on each of these. You can use templates, you can expand the templates, and you can, for example, say things like, I want 30 hourlies, 30 dailies, and three monthlies. And Sanoid will take care of taking all those snapshots for you on time, including taking an extra one if you had like a power off event, you know, that causes you to miss the normal time that you'd have a snapshot get taken, like right on the hour for an hourly snapshot. If your server happened to be powered off for half an hour, well, it'll take one immediately when it comes back up because it knows your short one. Um, it will take them for you. It will remove them for you according to schedule. It makes life a whole lot easier. <clears throat> Alan? Yeah, uh, I also use a, another tool called ZFS Snapshot Management. And it is the same idea of, I need a snapshot every 15 minutes, and I'm going to keep the ones at the top of the hour uh, for longer than the ones I normally keep every 15 minutes. And then I'm going to keep the ones from Sundays for six months or something like that to make sure that I have that skew going backwards, but I don't end up with too many snapshots, which I think leads to our next topic. Yeah, so... Particularly, I find folks that are familiar with uh, Linux and the Linux Logical Volume Manager, they're, they tend to be a little bit leery about snapshots because in a lot of more primitive file system or block storage frameworks that allow snapshots, they have a pretty significant performance impact. <clears throat> pretty much the moment you take a snapshot in LVM, the logical volumes that you snapshotted, they don't perform as well as they had, and that impact scales up rapidly the more of those snapshots you take and keep around. So they need to be pretty ephemeral in that environment. With ZFS, it doesn't work that way. Uh, snapshot, when you take it, it occurs pretty much instantaneously. 
Um, you'll get an immediate return on the command line and you'll see the snapshot there when you take it because all you're really doing is copying a block pointer tree. Uh, so it happens just about instantly and the act of taking the snapshot does not have a significant performance impact. Neither does having the snapshot around. However, if you have a ton of snapshots, and this is not a per pool thing, this is a per data set or per ZVOL thing. If you've got lots of snapshots on a particular data set, you can see some maintenance operations slowing down. In particular, a ZFS list uh, can become just absolutely glacial if you've got thousands of snapshots lying around that you probably shouldn't. Yeah, um, I imagine it's it's pretty much unnoticeable <clears throat> up to about a thousand snapshots per data set. And so when you're doing recursive, you can you can have 900 snapshots on each of 100 data sets and that's still going to be fine. But if you have, you know, 10,000 snapshots on one data set, that's where you're going to see it getting quite slow. Now, that's a little bit too uh that's a little too simplistic, honestly, Maybe. because how many snapshots you can have per data set without slowing down ZFS list is going to be very dependent on, among other things, how much RAM you've got in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're starved for RAM, you will not be able to support as many snapshots before those ZFS list operations start becoming a problem. Now, with that said, again, you know, this is a kind of a maintenance issue. It's not really a using the data set issue. The data set itself doesn't slow down. It's the act of listing all of the snapshots for that data, shit, data set that can end up taking like literally minutes if you wind up with too many of them. Yeah, and <clears throat> the big thing to, to consider when comparing it to something like LVM is ZFS is doing copy and write all the time, no matter what. So when you create a snapshot, all it's doing is saying, oh, that block is uh, older than the snapshot. So I can't mark it as free space now because it's part of that snapshot. So it's literally doing less work. It's not freeing data because it's part of a snapshot, but it's not, it doesn't change the fundamental way that ZFS has to read or write data. Whereas with yeah. LVM, as soon as you have a snapshot, <clears throat> it's changing the way storage works from the software point and you use like 40% of your performance for having any snapshots and like another 10% for each additional snapshot you have. And it gets really bad really quickly. With ZFS, you don't have that. It's always doing it the same way and the snapshots don't make it any more expensive. Yep. All right, so we kind of covered the, the costs, you know, what there is of having a lot of snapshots. Um, the snapshots themselves don't, this is one of those things, it's, it's kind of hard to explain to somebody who's not already accustomed to the environment. Everybody always wants to know, well, how much space do snapshots take up? And the simple answer is none whatsoever, but that's not really a complete or a useful answer. When you take a snapshot of a data set, initially it takes no additional space on your storage. Um, it begins to take space as your data set diverges from the condition it was in when you took that data set. So let's say that you've got a one terabyte file server and you take a snapshot of your one terabytes of files. And then right now you've still only got one terabyte of data, right? But now let's say that you delete a hundred gigs from that one terabyte. Well, that 100 gigs has been deleted from your current production file system, but it's still present in that snapshot. So now let's say you add another new 100 gigs of data. Now you've got 1.1 terabytes because you've got the original 100 gigs that still lives in that snapshot, and you've got the new 100 gigs that you added to production. So production still shows it's a one terabyte file system, but because of the delta in between its data and that snapshot's data, you're actually taking up 1.1 terabytes on disk. Now, um, you can kind of figure out what your particular model looks like in terms of how often you save and delete data and therefore how much room you expect it to take to have a particular snapshot policy. You know, if you're keeping 30 dailies, three monthlies, whatever. The one thing that you do wanna be careful of here you never want to fall into the trap of thinking 30 days and one monthly will take up the same amount of space. They do not. The 30 dailies actually will take up more space. Now, not too much more space typically in that case, but once you get down to the really frequent snapshots, hourlies, or like Alan was talking about, if you've got them going every 15 minutes, maybe even every five minutes, maybe even every minute, I've seen all these things in production environments, and that works but you have to be careful not to keep too many of them, especially these really short-lived ones, because if you're snapshotting any kind of a, a data set or ZVOL 
that has temporary data saved to it, those really frequent snapshots will capture this ephemeral stuff that you don't really care about so much. You don't need to maintain for a long time. It's just, you know, like slash TMP on Linux or FreeBSD or, you know, C Windows temp if you got Windows VMs, that kind of stuff. If you take really frequent snapshots, you're going to capture a lot of that churn and temporary stuff that normally gets written and immediately deleted. So you need to make sure you thin those more frequently than you do the longer lived snapshots. Yep. <clears throat> All right, so when we talk about the recovery time objective, again, this, in my opinion, is more challenging than recovery point objective because you've got so many more things to think about. Understand your failure modes. We went over this a little bit earlier. Uh, some very common ones are you have a user who clicks the shiny link and now you've got ransomware on your system busily encrypting everything it can reach. Uh, that is basically indistinguishable from having a malicious rogue employee. Maybe they learned they were going to get fired or think they're going to or just decide they hate you and they're gonna quit and they're gonna delete absolutely everything on their way out. That's basically the same type of failure mode because you're still talking about employee level access wrecking everything that that particular user can get to. So that's one common failure mode. Another common failure mode would be, you know, a part failing on a server. And the implication can be a little bit different depending on what part it is. You know, if you have a, a network card fail, you may be able to just plug the cable into a different interface on the same server, or you may need to actually replace that card, but that's a pretty quick and easy operation. You'll almost certainly have another network card locally available, and you can just power down your server, plug in the card, plug in the cable, and go, and you're done. <clears throat> but if, for example, you have a motherboard fail on a production box, that can be a huge RTO challenge if you're not maintaining spare hardware that's absolutely ready to go right away. Because if you don't have another, uh, you know, if you don't have another motherboard of the exact same make, model, firmware, everything just lying around in a closet ready to go, it may take you anywhere from half a business day to two or three business days to source the motherboard. It may take you a significant, you know, amount more time to actually perform the physical replacement. Uh, you might have some minor issues in operating system reconfiguration if there are any kind of parts differences in between the original motherboard and the new one. These are all things that can really bump up your recovery time objective and worse yet, make it difficult to predict. So when you talk about wanting to protect from this kind of failure mode, where you have an entire machine go offline, I find it's best to have spare capacity available and to be regularly replicating to that spare machine. So in my own environments, I've basically always got one production server. I've got one hot spare server and production replicates to hot spare on the hour, every hour, 24 hours a day. So if I have a motherboard go out on my production server, all the VMs are down, all my employees are just you know sitting, doing nothing, collecting their paychecks without having to do any work, uh, bully for them, but I wanna get that fixed quickly. Instead of making repairing the production server become a blocking point to getting the employees working again, what I wanna do now is I just wanna spin up all those VMs on my hot spare hardware that's in the same building on the same subnet. And I've got several ways I can go about that. I can either just spin up the VMs directly based on those replicated data sets that are already there, or if it's identical hardware and I don't like the recovery point objective that I'll get from doing that, maybe I don't want to time travel backwards, you know, an entire hour to my last replicated snapshot. Um, I might be able then, if both servers have hot swap base, to literally just power them both down, pull all the drives out of the production box, slam them into the hot spare box, power it up, and poof, that's production. But basically, just you want to understand what these options are ahead of time. And then finally, you know, your worst, uh, your, your worst catastrophe typically is going to be like an entire site outage. Uh, maybe somebody put tinfoil in the microwave in the break room and all the sprinklers came on and every machine in the building is just completely trashed. Maybe you had a, a fire that burned everything down, whatever. Now you're talking about having to deal with going to your offsite disaster recovery. And here's where things start getting a little bit stickier because your options potentially get more expensive. You don't have to make any one particular choice. Like I could tell you, you can have an offsite DR. It should be 
completely identical hardware to your production and your hot spare, which means then you can just drag it right into a construction trailer, fire up your VMs on it, bring in a bunch of laptops from Walmart and have your employees working immediately. That is totally a valid option. I know a lot of folks who do exactly that. It's great. I love it. There are also folks who are like, well, realistically, how likely are we to have one of those failures? How frequently are one of those failures going to happen? Am I going to be willing to say, yeah, if it takes me a little bit more time to recover in that particular instance, I'm willing to do it in order to save some money. That may or may not be a great choice, but you just need to understand it when it comes down and say, all right, well, our offsite disaster recovery, um, it might not be hardware at all. It might be cloud. And then we've got to download everything from there to new hardware and go. Or it may be hardware that we own that's in an offsite location, but it's not powerful enough to actually spin up the production workload with all the employees behind it, in which case, again, you've got to come up with some new hardware. It's not that any of these things are necessarily unacceptable. It's a case of like, you have to understand what all these failures look like. You have to talk with leadership about that and say, okay, if we make this decision, this is what it looks like if and when we have that catastrophe. Are we all okay with that? Are we on board with it? Okay, good, moving on. So then if and when any of those catastrophes happen, you've already thought this out ahead of time. You know what your options are. You know when to just roll back to a snapshot and prod, you know when to spin up snapshots on Hotspare, you know when to swap drives from production to Hotspare, you know when and how to deal with your offsite disaster recovery. So as soon as you know what your catastrophe was, you know both how you're going to respond to it and how long that will take. And you can communicate that to leadership. That can also make a huge difference in your own quality of life when catastrophes happen. Because as anybody who's ever recovered from a business catastrophe can tell you, you've usually got you know, your C-suite, your owner, whatever. They're breathing down your neck, whining and crying. When will it be up? When will it be up? When will it be up? And you're just like, oh my God, I just want them off my back and let me work. Well, if when they ask that question, you can turn around, lock eyes with them and tell them, this is what I have to do. And this is when it will be up. And you are completely confident about that. You're not waffling. You'll discover that most of the time, most of those leadership types, they will actually get off your neck and let you work and let you achieve that RTO that you promised them to begin with. But if you don't look like you know what's going on, if you're sitting there sweating and hemming and hawing, and well, I think this, and I'm not sure that, it's going to be really difficult to get them off your back. Yeah. And like you said, if, if you've planned for this RTO and RPO, then, you know, it's, this is what our plan has always been. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, this is what you wanted. <laughs> it makes answering the phone an awful lot easier. And I actually got a chance to uh, kind of practice what I, what I preached this morning, oddly enough. Uh, I had a server go down in... <laughs> In theory, uh, a dev server went down. In practice, uh, we had some folks that snuck a production workload kind of in rogue onto a dev server. And so I got a call first thing this morning. Uh, that dev server had gone down, but nobody actually understood that yet. All they knew was this mission critical service is offline. I can't reach it. Oh, God, what's going on? But because I am monitoring everything, I could look at my Nagios and see, okay, dev one is down. And okay, yeah, that service that you want, you, you put that on the dev box. So that's our problem. Now go in there and turn on the dev box and you'll be fine. But also I know even before we come to that point, I know I'm solid because I'm monitoring production, I'm monitoring hot spare, I'm monitoring offsite DR. And basically no matter what we find out the problem is, I know I'm gonna have the answer to it. I know I'm gonna be able to clearly communicate this is what we're going to do. This is how long it's going to take. And we'll be up and good with this RTO and RPO right then. So again, you just kind of, you, you get that whole cold sweat out of your life. Um, I think most of us who are sysadmins have had that before where, you know, you have a client call in or you have your boss call you at home and they're like, oh God, stuff is down. And you just, you know, you, you kind of want to freeze up in place. You're like, oh, this is terrible. I don't like it. I don't know what's going to happen. And this is going to suck. But if you monitor all this stuff, you practice all this stuff, you understand your infrastructure and your failure recovery, it's just another day at the office, no different really from a day where everything works. Yeah, uh, there's, there's no way to explain just how nice it is to have a plan that exists on paper in a document or whatever, so that when that call comes in the middle of the night and you just woke up and you're groggy, it's like, I don't have to try to remember how to do this. We have this plan that outlines all the steps I have to take. 
I remember the first time I actually encountered malware, uh, you know, in the wild, had to deal with it in anger. One of my clients called in, uh, they were getting a bunch of garbage in a database backed application. And uh, I didn't have a lot going on right then. So I just said, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and drive in and take a look at that. And by the time I got there, the amount of user reports had just absolutely cascaded uh, because they, it, as it turns out, they, you know, they had ransomware. It was encrypting everything on the server. They first noticed it with corrupt data from this database application. But as time went on, they started noticing, you know, the ransom notices on desktops everywhere and uh, individual files corrupted, all this kind of thing. And when I looked at that, I thought I was like, oh, you've got ransomware. And you, you get kind of this immediate panic out of the client folks because they've heard all this stuff in the news. They know how bad that is. They've seen all, this, all these stories of businesses being offline for weeks and trying to decide whether or not to pay a ransom, whatever. But even though I had never actually dealt with ransomware specifically before, I knew how to recover from it. And I was just excited. I was like, oh, cool. I get to actually roll back from ransomware. This is neat. So I've got my sea level is like absolutely panicking behind me. But then, you know, the uh, kind of the onsite IT person, you know, the in-house one looks at me, looks at what I'm doing and, you know, the, the smile on my face and looks over at the CEO and says, look at him. Does he look worried? We're fine. I said, yeah, he'll be back up in 15 minutes. And they were. Yeah. And I think a lot of that confidence that you get from that comes from practicing it. It's like we've said before, you know, the, the key disaster recovery is not successful backups. It's successful restores. Yep. Uh, you, you think you have successful backups, but you don't know until you've tried them. And so practicing your recovery is you know, it's basic. It's like when you were a kid in school, we practiced fire drills so that if there ever was a fire, we would know what to do and how to get out of the building safely. Because you have to do the same thing uh, with your backups. But you can do a much better job of it. You know, yes. when you're practicing disaster recovery, you can get so much closer to real world conditions than, you know, a fire drill in an elementary school. Right. Uh, you're, no matter how many fire drills you do in elementary school, it's going to feel different when the fire really happens, but as a sysadmin, ops person, whatever you want to call it, um, when you have a real failure and you've practiced all your failure modes and you understand them, it really is no different. And it really does become just not scary at all because you know exactly what you're doing and it's awesome. I think that's it for this slide. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, uh, I have a bad habit of getting ahead of myself and covering slides before we get to them. We, we've kind of talked about this already, but uh, these, are, these are kind of the, the basic categories, I think, of in failure modes. Almost any failure is going to fall under one of these categories. Uh, you know, a human error non-root, in which case you could just roll back to the most recent snapshot prior to the error in production. You also have the option, sometimes you may not want to roll back an entire data set, um, whether it contains a VM or whether it's just a file share or whatever. Maybe somebody just made a catastrophic error in a single file. Keep in mind, another one of those recovery modes that you should be practicing is figure out, okay, how do I dig into a snapshot and cherry pick a particular file or piece of data out of it without having to roll my entire production back? Um, now, if it's just a file share that's really easy, you can literally just go into the special directory for the snapshot and copy that file out and be done. Uh, if you've got virtual machines, it may be a little bit more difficult. My own environment is usually going to be Linux machines with ZFS storage and the, uh, the KVM, Linux Kernel Virtual Machine Hypervisor. And in that environment, uh, what you end up wanting to do is clone the snapshot and then create an NBD block device based on that snapshot. And then you can mount that go into it, cherry pick out a file, destroy your clone, and you know, get your file back to your user and be off to the races. A root human error is a much bigger deal. Uh, you wanna protect against root human errors by limiting how many humans have access to root stuff to begin with, right? Because even a sysadmin, if that sysadmin, if they've got admin privileges inside the VMs, but not on a VM host, there's only so much damage they can do because whatever they muck up on the VMs, you can always roll back the VM to before they did it. But if that same sysadmin has root on your production host, now they've got the capability to, to screw things up much more impressively. Uh, probably the worst of these I ever saw was I had a, uh, a junior admin 
I still have no idea what he thought he was doing, but he actually replicated a gold image on top of a production virtual machine and didn't tell anybody what he'd done. So by doing that, he not only screwed up the VM, he also destroyed every single snapshot of the VM because he didn't tell anybody that had time to replicate over to Hotspare and destroy all the snapshots on Hotspare. I found out about it just in time to catch it before it replicated offsite disaster recovery and wiped out all the snapshots there. So when you've got potentially untrustworthy factors with root access, you have to be much more careful and you have to think about those things. You have to figure out, um, you know, in the slide it says reduced access to backup infrastructure. Um, you may want to have one set of production admins who has full root on all the production VM hosts, but absolutely does not have root access on the backup hosts and vice versa, depending on scale. Or, you know, maybe you've got one just absolute super sysadmin who has the keys to every single castle and junior sysadmins only have access on production, not on backup. And this is one of those things that I find people tend to conceptually intuitively, they tend to get it wrong. They tend to think of production as the most important resource and backup as secondary. That's completely backwards. Uh, your backup infrastructure is absolutely hands down the most critical part of your infrastructure because it's the part that's supposed to go down last. So it's the last thing you want to give somebody access to. Yep. Uh, beyond that, we talked about, you know, minor versus major hardware failures. And then finally, you know, complete catastrophic site disasters when you've got to recover from offsite disaster recovery, and you really have to think about what that means. Do I have to download all my data from the cloud? Uh, do I have to procure new production hardware? Uh, can I just stand everything up directly on my offsite disaster recovery? In larger environments, possibly even, can I not only stand up everything immediately on my offsite DR, but provide access to it temporarily with a VPN to the disaster recovery site so my production site is even up immediately if it, you know, reduced latency, because now instead of uh, the, the stuff being local, it's got to go over a wire guard tunnel or what have you to another site. There's a lot of possibilities here. And what's going to be possible for you is largely dependent on your budget. And your budget, again, is largely dependent on how well you communicate all these issues in business terms to your leadership. Yeah, you know, for a video streaming company with <clears throat> hundreds of terabytes of data to be backed up, it's we have the offsite DR. If something happens to the, the main site, we're just going to use the VPN and fail over to that backup. Uh, and if it comes down to it, you know, because of the volume of data, it would take literally more than a month to upload all the data, even with you know a multi-gigabit link. Uh, we just unrack the machines, put them in a truck, and drive them to a data center and hook them back up there. And now you know, we're back up in a couple of hours instead of it taking months to transfer the data over the network. That also brings up a, a really nice technique that you can have for getting an offsite disaster recovery uh, setup started. You don't have to do your initial full backup over the network in a lot of cases. Now, if you're backing up to a cloud service, sure. Uh, if you've got 100 terabytes worth of data to back up, the first time you back it up, you're going to have to move 100 terabytes across the internet. It's going to take a long time. It's going to suck. On the other hand, if you control your offsite disaster recovery site, if that's uh, either, you know, in a small business, that might be a sea levels home uh, in a larger environment that might be a data center or just, you know, another uh, office for the same business across town or across the state or in another state or whatever. Point is, if you control the hardware and the environment in both places, what you can do is you can bring your offsite DR box in do your first replication over the LAN at your production site, and then just drive the DR box to the offsite. And then you never have to do anything but incrementals over your slower WAN link, which is nice. Yeah, I, we have a customer do exactly that. They had 600 terabytes of data. Uh, so when they got their new machine, they got the identical machine uh, to go with it, shipped them to their site, loaded all their data on it. And once they had a good set of snapshots between the two machines over back-to-back -back 40 gig, they shipped the DR version off to a bunker, like six hour drive away. Uh, and they have a one gig point to point link between them that keeps replicating the data over time. And, you know, as long as they don't write more than a gigabit, a gigabit per second to uh, the master, then the, the DR site always is up to date uh, and they won't lose their data. Yep. <clears throat> but yeah, it would have been practically impossible to do 
600 terabytes over a, a one gig straw. You just need to be patient, Alan. <laughs> yes. All right. So, um, you know, again, we've kind of gotten ahead of ourselves a little bit. You, you want to practice recovery techniques before you need them. Uh, the time to figure out how you're going to re recover from a catastrophe is not after the catastrophe has happened. You want to plan for, you know, you want to not only plan for worst case scenarios, you want to actually practice them. You want to know for a fact what you're going to do if giant swaths of data get deleted or if, uh, you know, you have a hardware failure, if a server is offline, you want to actually know how all this is going to work. Now, if you can't manage this by actually screwing around with production, because it's production, you can practice all these modes with a sandbox environment. Um, there are lots of different ways to set this up. My personal favorite um, is use actual hardware when and if possible. You know, if you've got a production server and a hot spare server, you can mimic that setup with a couple of cheap desktop machines and you can call one of them, you know, your sandbox production and your sandbox hot spare. And you can spin up some VMs on them or containers or whatever your workload normally looks like. And you can just absolutely go to town chaos monkey style on it, mess things up, practice recovery, make sure you know how it works. I mean, you should be devoting some time and some energy and some thought to this on a regular ongoing basis. This is what you do when everything is going right. You know, um, you can also practice things like when you have individual drive failure. Uh, this, so this also extends to you know, when your redundant storage loses redundancy, whether it's one drive out of a mirror or whether you lose two drives out of a RAID Z2 VDEV, you know, what have you, you should have practiced that ahead of time. You should know what it looks like to recover from that, what the commands are, what it looks like when you run them, have a good idea of how long it will take to complete. Ideally, you want to do that on extra hardware as well. But even if you don't have any extra hardware to practice that kind of thing on, you can use file-based ZFS. Um, uh, VDEV can be based on disks, but it can also be based on simple files. You can use the truncate command to create a sparse file. So you can say, for example, truncate uh, s1t, 1t.bin, and you create a one terabyte sparse file. So even if you're doing this on a laptop and you've only got like a 256 gig SSD, as far as ZFS is concerned, that's a one terabyte drive, and you can even write to it as though it was a one terabyte drive. The only thing that's different is, you know, you can't actually put more than 256 gigs of data into it. But until then, it looks exactly like a one terabyte drive would. So you can create a really nice mock environment of your production hardware, just like it looks on your production hardware with the same amount of apparent space, the same number of apparent drives, you name it. And now you can start failing this stuff out. You can overwrite data. Uh, you can pull drives or virtual drives and see what happens. You can practice your replacement with a new virtual or real drive, all this kind of stuff. Again, this is what you should be doing in your, quote, downtime, unquote, when things aren't broken. So that, you know, when things are broken, it's not a bad day. It's just the show, you know, you're just you're stepping out there to the plate and you're knocking it out of the park. So finally, this is also how you know your recovery time objective. Um, if you've actually done your homework and you've been practicing all these failure modes, you've done them, you've recovered from them, you don't have to consult notes because, you know, you've built the muscle memory and like how you respond to these things and you know how you do it. Now you really truly know your RTO. You can communicate that clearly without that beat of sweat running down your face uh, when the actual failure happens and you've got panicky sea levels, you know, staring at you. You can calm them down because they see how calm you are. And even more so, you know, once you've had a failure or two and they've seen how this happens and that you tell them, look, this is how long it's going to take. Uh, no, you can't make this any faster, but it's not going to be slower either. This is, this is how we provision this. This is how it works. This is how it's going to go. And then you prove that the next failure you have it just gets even easier because they know just like you do, failure is just another day at the office. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. Last time we practiced this, it took this long, so it should take about that long this time. Yep. Okay. Uh, any questions? I don't think we haven't had any questions pop up in the Zoom Q&A thing so far. But we're uh, pretty much out of time, but uh, do feel free to pop in a question, uh, or you can reach out to us via email or Twitter or whatever and send us your question there, and we can answer that. 
And remember, if you want help with implementing this or monitoring and managing your ZFS or uh, FreeBSD development or ZFS development, then please do reach out to uh, us here at clarisystems.com. Uh, here okay. we go. Yeah, uh, question. Preferred auto replication utilities. Uh, for me, that's going to be Syncoid. That's part of the Sanoid package. And again, it ought to be my favorite since I wrote the initial version of it. Yeah, um, ZX Sphere is definitely not my favorite, but it is what I use because uh, I end up maintaining it when the original author stopped using it. <laughs> All right, uh, next question from David Vogler. For recovery procedure documentation, how granular should the docs be? Um, there's not really a simple answer to that. The documentation should be granular enough for the people who are expected to follow the documentation, basically. Uh, that might mean just you. That might mean you and junior sys, uh, that might mean you and some junior sys admins or possibly some, you know, some mercenaries you bring in. You might wanna say, well, I want my documentation to be granular enough that somebody with no real initial knowledge can follow this through step by step. Uh, the final possibility, and again, it's different for every environment. If you've got unusually technical and involved, uh, you know, C-suite that wants to look directly at what you've got, then you may need to target it to them as well. In some cases, you may even want to have separate sets of documentation. You know, one kind of both dumbed down and uh, you know, more detailed for use when a C-level wants to see that you know what's going to happen and what the procedure looks like. And a second set that just helps you or an admin, you know, who has a reasonable expectation of, you know, beginning knowledge to be able to more quickly and easily just follow through it and, and get done. I think the other part of the answer is what, you know, some future 3 a.m. version of you is going to appreciate. <laughs> correct, correct. And I would advise folks, you know, when you, when you think about how do I want this documentation to look, um, you want to, you wanna, in my opinion, build the docs in much the same way that we laid things out here. You want to be thinking in terms of like, what are my common failure modes? Um, you know, what individual events fit in this particular failure mode? And what is my recovery process from these failure modes that can give you a, a much more streamlined set of instructions to follow? and you know, ways to think about this. Like, so you, you don't necessarily need to think of malware and like a rogue user as being radically different events because in terms of what the impact is and how you recover from it, they're nearly identical. So you wanna have that idea of like, what do my buckets look like that I can drop these particular events into the right bucket and follow the right procedure. Anybody else? All right, great. Thank you everyone for coming. And uh, if you missed part of this, uh, the video version will be up on our website uh, in a little bit, like not today, but sometime in the not too distant future. Thanks everybody.